Hello everyone, welcome in. Let's talk about Lorcana into the Inklands. Lorcana set three has had some time to settle and it's become a lot more clear which cards are driving the format forward. This will be the first of a video series diving into each card, all 204 cards and in into the Inklands. Since the release of set three, I've been playing a ton of Lorcana in print and digital, so hopefully I can provide some good insight for some of the cards this set as we go through. I'm gonna be covering each card, discussing its potential for competitive play in a constructed format. I suppose I should rank or rate each card as we go through. That seems like a fun thing to attempt. So I'll be scientifically marking every card on a scale from Gantu to Merlin Goat. This rating system is clearly unwavering and indisputable. And don't worry, if you'd rather see a standard tier list, I'll include one after each ink color, ranking the cards based on their strength. In general, I give the highest ranks to cards that are key components of top decks or just rock solid staples that find themselves in almost every deck of that color. Meanwhile, the lowest ranked cards are ones that I find relatively unplayable because other strong cards exist or the playstyle they encourage is just not strong enough for consideration. Anyways, hopefully that makes sense. For each new card, I'll introduce it for anyone new and then talk about its competitive potential for constructed, discussing its strength in certain combos or decks but I will have to be brief in order to get through all the cards in a reasonable amount of time, so let's get right to it. Into the Inklands starts off strong with an exciting Tailspin character, Blue Von Bruinwald the 13th. He's an uninkable three cost amber character, zero strength, three willpower, and one lore. Traits are dreamborn and hero. Blue has the bodyguard keyword, making him a welcome addition to amber aggro decks, where you can follow up a turn two Simba with another bodyguard adding further to the defensive aggro opener in Amber. But Baloo also gains two lore when he's banished, and this means he will almost always provide two or three lore by the time his job is done. This makes Baloo a welcome threat in hyper-aggressive decks, specifically paired with Emerald, or perhaps even a Ruby Mufasa list. Baloo's stats and uninkable status do hold him back a bit, but I think he'll surprise us with the pressure he provides. Next up is Bernard, brand new agent. He's a four cost inkable amber character, one five stats, quests for two lore, and is a storyborn hero. Bernard allows you to ready one of your characters whenever you end your turn with him exerted. This is a neat ability, and he's the first of a couple cards in this set that have activations at the end of your turn. And although Bernard's ability does take a turn to kick in, since you'll need to play him out and then quest or sing with him on the next turn, his ability is fun and it works well with aggressive cards or even niche picks like Christopher Robin. A 1-5 stat line at a 4 cost isn't anything too special, but at least he has that 2 lore as expected from an Amber character. Next up is an awesome card that I've been highly anticipating since Lorcana was first announced, Chernabog Evil Doer. This is a beefy storyborn villain, a 10 cost uninkable Amber character, with 9 strength and 9 willpower and he quests for 3 lore. He has quite the hefty price there to play him out, however his ability The Power of Evil says for each character in your discard, you pay one less ink to play Chernabog. This card rewards you for sticking it out to the late game, or better yet, encourages a fun card filtering strategy to fill up your discard so Chernabog can join the fray. He'll be great combined with Steel, since cards like Simba Future King, the Bayou, and even Ransack can help combo him out quickly. And cards like Whole New World and Hades are also fun ideas. Hades helps you in case your Whole New World also hits your Chernabog into your discard. Chernabog also has a second ability, Summon the Spirits. Whenever you do finally play him out, he's going to shuffle all characters from your discard back into your deck. This is certainly intended to slow down your ability to play your second Chernabog back to back. This definitely makes it difficult to run more than, let's say, two copies of Chernabog. And overall, I'm hesitant to expect anything meta-defining out of him, other than a few of those quirky lists I mentioned, or perhaps a Mufasa list. And keep in mind, even though he has that 9-9 stat line, it's really that 3 lore that matters a lot of the time, and there are easier ways to get out early 3 lore amber characters. Next we have Dalmatian Puppy Tailwagger, which of course there's actually 5 alternate versions of, all with different art. These pups are 2 cost inkable characters, with 2 strength, 4 willpower, and 1 lore. They have Storyborn and Puppy Traits, which is a new one and they have their unique ability that allows you to play up to 99 copies of Dalmatian Puppy in your deck, which is delightfully thematic and just plain fun. These puppies can combo together with a bunch of different Amber cards, 
Some like Lucky and Perdita we'll see later on in the list, but oddly enough, there's no true specific puppy synergy. They only work in these combos because they're low cost characters. Because of that, there's really no reason to run puppies over Simba Protective Cub or really any other two cost character. So I have to rate them pretty low. Next up is Joshua Sweet, the doctor. He's a four cost inkable character with storyborn and ally traits. He's got one strength and five willpower along with bodyguard, making him an instant classic Amber character. He also sports two lore, which is always welcome, especially in a bodyguard that wants to quest and protect other characters anyways. And he brings to mind some cards we just covered like Baloo. Now we have a turn two, three, and four bodyguard in Amber. He reminds me of Bernard too, since Joshua here actually shares the same stats. Amber is certainly leaning heavy into character support, with more bodyguards, heals, and ways to ready characters for protection. Overall, Joshua is a solid common card, nothing too crazy for constructed, but I do think he's a bit overlooked at the moment. He's a good option to splash into some early aggro decks where he can protect some turn three cards like Doc or Arthur. Kida Atlantean is up next. This storyborn hero princess joins the rank of other one cost two twos like Stitch New Dog and others across different inks. And although she's a vanilla card, she does have princess synergy and of course has a Floodborne card that we'll talk about in just a moment. Because of all that potential and the fact that you wouldn't play her without her Floodborne counterpart, she does outshine some other turn one characters, so she gets a few points for that. And of course, Kida is joined by her awesome looking Floodborne variant, Kida Protector of Atlantis. And this is our first legendary card of Into the Inklands. This Floodborne hero princess now costs five ink and is still inkable. She has three strength and five willpower and quests for two lore. She can shift in for three ink, which is good for her stats, and is close to the standard we've seen in other Floodborne cards that shift in for three. She also activates her ability when played, which reduces all characters' strengths by three until the beginning of your next turn. In other words, Kida wants to shift in and quest right away, along with everyone else on board. Then, unless your opponent can boost up their strength somehow, or play a rush character, your questing board should be safe from any challenges on that next turn. It's clear that Kida is a great choice for any aggro lovers, but she also costs five ink, which means she can sing a ton of great songs across different inks, which adds to her value a bit more. Playing her can be somewhat risky though, as it really requires you to be ahead on the lore race already. And if your opponent does rush in a Maui or a Madame Mim Fox, for example, they can take down your characters in a challenge without taking any damage themselves. This Kida does have a second additional small Kida and steal as a secondary shift target, which is good. And honestly, her 3-5 stat line on turn 3 is maybe my favorite part about her, even over her ability. A turn 3 shift Kida means she can usually quest safely and then challenge a character on turn 4, setting up great Rapunzel heal lines. And I still think any decent early game Amber card is going to be one that unlocks great setups like that for Rapunzel. But overall, Kida is a classic case of legendary with a flashy ability that falls a bit flat. And spoiler alert, we'll be seeing a good deal of that throughout the rest of the list. Next up, we have another Amber character, a four cost uninkable storyborn puppy. This is Lucky the 15th puppy. His two and three stats plus one lore are quite low for a four cost uninkable, but his abilities are what makes this lucky pup shine. He can exert to reveal three cards from your deck, placing each character with a two or less ink cost into your hand, the rest returning to the bottom of your deck. Obviously, this is meant to work thematically with a large number of puppies in your deck, but even beyond that, it's potentially one of the strongest card draw tools in the game, assuming you have a ton of one and two cost characters in your deck. And we are in Amber here, so there are certainly synergies that lead towards that go wide strategy. Lucky's second ability also comes in handy in these types of decks. Puppy Love says whenever Lucky quests, if you have four or more characters in play, each of them quests for one extra lore this turn. This is a potentially game changing ability if you can line up your combos just right to set everything up. And there already have been a few hyper aggro decks that add in a few copies of Lucky as he can really help keep the deck afloat as it begins to run out of steam. Next is Minnie Mouse Musical Artist. This two cost inkable character brings more singing power to Amber with her singer three keyword. And we know how powerful an early singer three can be. Minnie is a dreamborn hero with a 131 stat line, which we all know by now is a decent stat spread in the early game for Minnie Mouses, surviving a lot of early pressure. Minnie also brings an ability to the table. She can heal two damage from one of your characters whenever you play a bodyguard. 
This is one of the more interesting cards so far as it really melds together so many core aspects of Amber. Songs, bodyguards, high willpower, it all comes together nicely with this mini mouse. In theory, this card could see play in a lot of great decks. After all, Singer 3 has proven to be a valuable ability, but as it stands, song decks like Steel Song are already stuffed to the brim with incredible cards. So for Minnie to find herself as a new inclusion, she really needs to move the needle in terms of improving an already extremely solid deck. I'm not certain she can do that just yet, even if I do think she's a strong card on her own. Next we have Miss Bianca, Rescue Aid Society Agent. She's a two cost, two two, one lore character, Storyborn plus hero traits, and she has Singer 4. We've seen this before in the first chapter with Sebastian, and he's been a pretty rare pick, sometimes finding a spot in Amber Steel decks, but overall hasn't seen much action. It is worth mentioning that in set three, we do have two new four cost songs, one of which is no doubt a strong and popular card, especially in a location heavy meta. So perhaps Bianca and Sebastian will find a bit more priority thrown their way as time goes on, but for now, they're not a key component in any competitive decks. Next up, we have Mr. Snoop's Inept Businessman. He's a six cost inkable amber character, a dreamborn ally with four strength, eight willpower and two lore. This is our first six cost amber vanilla actually. And when compared with the seven cost bubbles, who has been nothing but underwhelming, I don't see a lot of hope here for Mr. Snoop's in Constructed. Eight willpower is a great number in Lorcana, but when compared further with Surfer Stitch, who sports the same stats, plus his great ability for one additional ink, it's really hard to justify playing Mr. Snoops. At least he's a common card and not a rare card like Bubbles. Let's continue our amber trend of big willpower characters with Nani, Protective Sister. This is a six cost inkable storyborn hero that has three strength, six willpower, and quests for two lore. She adds onto the growing line of Amber bodyguards, as we now have Simba, Baloo, Joshua Sweet, and now Nani. If you play out a Lilo on turn one and your opponent can't hit her with an action, you're not gonna get past all those defenders, especially big sister Nani. The easiest comparison for this card though are the other five cost Amber bodyguards. Goofy provides the same stats, but swaps the extra lore for the ability to heal musketeers. And Maximus has similar stats, but provides the support keyword. I think there are times where that extra lore on Nani will make her the right choice. And hey, with all these bodyguards, perhaps an Amber Steel Tabard deck is finally viable? Yeah, probably not. The real issue for cards like Nani, Goofy, or Maximus is that by the time you have five ink, there are just so many insanely good characters that you're gonna wanna be playing. I think if she just had one more willpower and could survive a hit from Maui, it would make a huge difference. But for now, she's feeling good, but nothing game changing. Next, we have Orville Ace Pilot. He's an inkable two cost Amber character, a storyborn ally with one strength, four willpower and one lore. He is a common vanilla and although I'm a fan of his stat line on turn two, there's no reason to play him over Rapunzel or Sneezy. Both share his stats exactly, but provide additional traits and abilities, which is a shame because I really love the illustration on this card here. Maybe next time, buddy. Our next card is Patch Intimidating Pup. He's a four cost inkable amber character with three four stats and one lore. Patch can also exert with his ability, giving a chosen character minus two strength until the start of your next turn. Reducing strength hasn't been a fantastic power so far in Lorcana, and when comparing Patch to cards like Aurora, who cost the same and also reduces opponent's strength, I like the win played aspect of her ability more. Now Patch could provide more opportunity to make use of the ability over the course of the game since it's repeatable. And when I think of other new cards like Madame Medusa or Kit Cloudkicker, the ability to reduce opponent's strength is actually kind of spicy. There could be something here that's being overlooked, but for now I do think I'll be overlooking it myself as I really don't see much need for Patch in any current decks. Next we do have another Dalmatian and I expect more from her as she's one of our Amber legendary cards. This is Perdita Devoted Mother. As I said, this Storyborn hero is our second Amber Legendary of the set, and I think she's already being underrated compared to all the buzz surrounding some of the other legendaries. Perdita is a six cost uninkable Amber character with one strength, six willpower, and two lore. Her ability says when you play this character and whenever she quests, you may play a character with a cost of two or less from your discard for free. This is a great ability, unlocking some great bounce-like combos in Amber. Of course, this only works on one or two cost characters, 
but even so, Perdita has some great targets. She can revive Pinocchio to repeat his power, as well as other strong amethyst abilities like Magic Broom or Snake. Perdita can also bring back and repeat powers from Ursula, Tremaine, Cindy, Hey Hey, or LeFou, or simply bring back strong aggro choices like Flynn, Pinocchio, or Simba. I think Perdita is going to unveil her potential for utility as time goes on, especially in aggro decks, as a sort of top end adding to the pressure that Amber can impose on the board. And she'll likely only get better in the future as more Lorcana expansions introduce more strong 1 and 2 cost characters. Speaking of strong 1 and 2 cost characters, let's cover a few, starting with Piglet, Pooh Pirate Captain. Piglet is a 2 cost Inkable Amber character. His traits are Dreamborn, Hero, Pirate, and Captain, and he has 2 strength, 2 willpower, and 1 lore. Piglet quests for 1 normally, but he can also quest for 3 lore if you have 2 or more characters in play. This is another Amber character that's good in aggro decks, specifically those that run several 1 cost characters, ensuring that by turn 3, you'll have your turn 1 plus turn 2 Piglet ready to quest as you play out your third character. It's a combo that requires some setup, but overall it's pretty consistent. And while some decks might dilute their early characters with locations, Piglet will likely need to stick with a character-heavy aggro list, but in those, he's a welcome addition. Next, we have Pluto-Friendly Pooch. I love new one-cost characters that provide unique abilities, as they can shake up a deck's playstyle right away, and Pluto certainly does that. This inkable Amber character is a storyborn ally that has zero strength, two willpower, and one lore. But Pluto comes with a really fun ability that allows him to exert to pay one less for the next character you play. He joins the likes of Doc and Mickey and Amber that help you play out characters faster with their character ramp abilities. Pluto allows you to play out a 3 cost character on turn 2, or play 2 different 2 cost characters on turn 3, and so forth. Right away some good ideas are obvious, such as a Pluto into a turn 2 Doc, who can then work together to skip to a turn 3 5 cost character like Mufasa. And even outside of a Mufasa deck, Pluto is just a catalyst for so many great ideas. Things like Turn 2 Detective Mickey or Turn 2 The Prince come to mind. But that's not all, Pluto also has a Floodborne upgrade with Pluto Determined Defender. This inkable Floodborne ally Amber character has 3 strength, 8 willpower, and quests for 2 lore. He can be played for 7 ink or shift in for 5 onto our small Pluto, which isn't bad at all for his stats. And since small Pluto can exert to reduce a character's cost, you could shift Big Pluto in for only 4 ink. Normally you wouldn't want to shift a Floodborne onto an exerted character, but that's where this Determined Defender's Bodyguard keyword comes in handy. You can shift him on turn 4, ready to defend with 8 willpower. On top of that, Pluto has the ability to heal up to 3 damage off him each turn, meaning opponents are pressured to taking down Pluto in one fell swoop. Not an easy task in any moment of the game, much less so early on if you can shift him in. His cost and stats are comparable to Surfer Stitch, who has always been a pain to take down, and overall I'd rank the small Pluto a bit higher, as he has more of a natural inclusion in a wider variety of decks, and even though I like this determined defender a lot, I can see why he's been cut from lists that just don't need a top end bodyguard. Next we have Pongo Determined Father. This inkable amber character is a storyborn hero, 3 ink cost, 3 strength, 2 willpower, and 1 lore. Once per turn you can use Pongo's Twilight Bark ability to pay 2 ink and reveal the top card of your deck. If it's a character card, you can add it to your hand, otherwise it goes to the bottom of your deck. This is a unique ability that sort of functions as a character version of Magic Mirror, and you only have to pay half the amount to draw. But the card you draw does have to be a character to work, and because of this, before the set released, I initially began thinking of a way to fit Pongo into a Mufasa deck, but I think there are simply too many other great characters right now that need to take priority in that list. And honestly, it doesn't feel great to spend 2 ink to draw a card in an aggro deck. Pongo is fun, but not effective enough to become a new must-play character. Next we have Queen of Hearts Wonderland Empress. This 3 cost inkable amber character is a dreamborn villain queen. She has a 3-3 stat line and quests for 1 lore. Whenever Queen of Hearts does quest, your other villain characters get plus 1 lore this turn. Finally, the villain synergy we saw from King Hades in set 1 has come full circle with a villainous queen ready to boost villain decks even more. At this point, there are a ton of villains in pretty much every ink color, and Wonderland Empress might just be the key to a viable villains deck. No one seems to have pulled this off just yet, and I still need to dive in and test her out in a few different decks myself, but this is a card that's easy to get excited about. Let me know down in the comments if you've tried out any full villain decks yet, and how it's gone. 
Next, we make a return back to Amber Puppies with Rolly Hungry Pup. He's a three cost inkable character with three three stats and one lore. His traits are Storyborn and Puppy, and he has the support keyword. There's not much to say here. I think I'd prefer playing a support character like Mulan on turn three, making use of her two lore. Although I suppose you could argue that three strength is better at taking down a challenging Mim Fox. But regardless, with cards like Doc and Ariel at the three cost level in Amber, I don't think anyone is chomping at the bit to throw copies of Roly into their decks. Next up is Tinkerbell Generous Fairy. We've seen a lot of Tinkerbells in Lorcana, but this time she's an Amber character, specifically a Storyborn Ally Fairy. She costs four ink to play, is uninkable, and she has one strength, four willpower, and quests for one lore. When you play Tinkerbell, you can look at the top four cards of your deck, and you can choose and reveal a character and put it in your hand, placing the rest at the bottom of your deck. This is, of course, the Be Our Guest ability in character form. Not a bad power at first glance, after all, be Our Guest is fairly popular and in many cases is one of the most powerful draw tools available in the early game, especially in Amber. But Be Our Guest really benefits from being inkable and being a song that can be sung for free. This leads me to be a bit worried about this Tinkerbell's chances of making a huge impact, especially considering the larger array of card draw options we now have. I think if she were inkable or could quest for two lore, I'd be much more willing to consider her for a list. Next is Windy Darling Talented Sailor. She's an inkable two-cost amber character with dreamborn and hero traits. And with one strength, three willpower, and two lore, she's a basic character with no abilities, but I do like her numbers a lot. The only other two-cost, two-lore characters in amber are LeFou and Sleepy. The three willpower is huge compared to LeFou, and Sleepy has to interplay exerted, which can leave him vulnerable, especially when you're on the draw. This does give Wendy some room for consideration, although you also have Piglet Pooh Pirate here in the running for Amber 2 cost questers. He has only one lore, but can usually bump it up to three, so he'll probably be the choice over Wendy in most aggro decks. Now we have our first Amber action of the set, 99 Puppies. This is an uninkable action that costs five ink to play. Whenever one of your characters quests this turn, gain one lore. 99 Puppies feels like a card that's meant to be the finale in an Amber aggro deck, after you go wide with Piglet and Rockstar Stitch combos, you can finish out the game with something like 99 Puppies. It gives you an extra lore for each character you quest with, and you can often have four or five characters out before playing this on turn five. It seems okay, but obviously it feels super bad when you're behind or your board is wiped. It really requires your opponent to ignore you for it to really pop off, and if that were the case, you were probably gonna win the game anyways. In this way, it reminds me of pack tactics. There's lots of potential for explosive lore, but it's a bit awkward to fit into a deck. I'd love to see someone make this one work though. Next is Boss's Orders. This is a one cost inkable amber action that gives one of your characters support. We've seen this exact card before in Sapphire with Work Together. That one was always super unplayable as you could just play Scepter of Arendelle for the same cost and ability without it being a one-time use. And there wasn't and still isn't enough action synergy to justify Work Together over Scepter. Now that we also have this action in Amber for Into the Ink Lands, support could help take down locations, I guess. And we do have some quirky action synergy with cards like Airfoil, so maybe this is slightly more playable than before, but probably not. Our first song of the set is Heal What Has Been Hurt. This inkable three cost Amber action song lets you heal up to three damage from a character and draw a card. This will be a great addition to healing decks, and it seems like an upgrade over Healing Glow or Hold Still, since it's singable and lets you draw a card. Now I'll be honest, I haven't ever played with any of these three cards, so maybe there's a heal deck guru out there who can share their experience in the comments. I guess we also have to compare this to Hakuna Matata, as it's also healing and also a singable song, but unless stronger heal decks emerge with Rapunzel Gifted Artist or Grand Pabby, I don't think this will see much play, and even then, I suspect item heals like Gumbo Pot and Popsicle will still likely take priority. Speaking of healing, Quick Patch is an inkable one cost amber action, and it can also heal up to three damage, this time from your locations. I haven't talked about it much yet, but locations are very strong in Lorcana, and I could see a world where a card like Quick Patch can really become a pain for opponents who want to take down a big location. It does feel pretty bad up against Steel though, since they have a few ways to make short work of locations, and for now, no one is really exploring location healing. And that makes a ton of sense. You'd be much better off just running more locations and throwing down additional threats rather than trying to sustain an existing location that may or may not be attacked. For our final Amber action, we have the inkable two cost song, The Bare Necessities. 
When played or sung, your opponent reveals their hand and discards a non-character card of your choice. This is an incredibly disruptive song that can really slow down your opponent's efforts to set up items and locations, or simply delete one of their valuable songs like Be Prepared or A Whole New World. This is an amber song, which means it already has a ton of synergy that makes it a breeze to find and play. And having a card to discard someone's action, item, or location, one that's potentially vital to their early game combo that they might have even spent effort in the mulligan for, is insanely powerful. This card is good on its own as a tech into many specific cards, obviously working well in an amber song deck, but it also combos well alongside other discard cards like You Have Forgotten Me, and especially emerald cards like Ursula, who can sing it twice. Also, Lucifer would love nothing more than to be played out right after the opponent discards their only action in their hand. I know these are all pretty specific combos, but this card is truly just a powerful song. Other than the introduction of locations, I think the Bare Necessities might end up being one of the most meta-defining cards of the entire Inklands expansion. Similar to the Amethyst Bounce Package in Set 2, Bare Necessities could be the entire reason someone decides to play Amber in this new format. If you haven't played against this yet, you better be prepared. No, seriously, you better be prepared like right now, otherwise they're going to discard it from your hand. Next, we have a few Amber items, starting with Cleansing Rainwater. This inkable two-cost item can heal up to two damage from each of your characters when banished. It's nothing too special, it joins in with other similar Amber and Sapphire items that really want to get together for a healing deck with Grand Pabby. And at some point, we might have so many supporting cards like this that the deck just becomes too consistent and explosive to pass up. But for now, I'm hesitant to rank this card very highly. Next is Heart of Atlantis. This four cost uninkable amber item can be turned to pay two less ink for the next character you play this turn. Heart of Atlantis is an upgraded lantern, which already means it has a ton of potential. It does feel a bit bad to break up a nice character curve with this four cost item, but if playing out a seven cost character on turn five sounds fun, this is the card for you. Add in a Lantern or Dock, and that 7 cost character can be played out even earlier. I immediately think of Amethyst as cards like Ursula or even the new Magicka Dispel could combo with Heart of Atlantis nicely, but I'm certain there are much better lines worth exploring. I do think this card has a chance of seeing some play though, maybe later in the set as some of the more hype ideas start to settle down. Next is Wildcat's Wrench. This 2 cost inkable amber item is essentially the item version of Quick Patch, Instead of a one-time use action to heal 3 off a location, Wildcat's Wrench can be exerted each turn to heal 2 damage. If your goal is to sustain your locations, this is probably the better move, and as it stands right now, I think you're more likely to throw this into a deck with item synergy rather than play Quick Patch in a random list. Neither card is doing anything too flashy, but I'm glad at least one color has the ability to heal up locations if they wanted to. Next up, we've talked about them long enough, it's time to talk about locations. In Amber, we kick things off with this one-cost inkable location, Neverland Mermaid Lagoon. This is a basic location that has a movement cost of 1, 4 willpower, and grants 1 lore each turn. And this spread of a 1-4-1 one, one vanilla for a cost of 1 has now been established as the base value for a turn 1 location. Because of that 4 willpower, you're likely to get 2 or so lore off this location, which sounds pretty good. But too much focus on these early game locations could result in your opponent setting up a strong board of characters. Early locations can be strong, but established attackers like Madame Mim Fox and Maui are already proving to be valuable location busters. But locations like Mermaid Lagoon are the beginning of many different location synergies and will be a staple for many location focused decks. Let's take a look at our next amber location, Pride Lands Pride Rock. This is a two cost uninkable location with a placement cost of two, seven willpower, and one lore per turn. Characters at this location gain two willpower, which makes it a great location for any character that you want to protect, or simply a place to beef up your bodyguards. And if you have a prince or king character in the Pride Lands, you can pay one less ink when playing characters, just passively across the board. Playing out multiple Pride Lands with the Simbas on them, for example, could lead to some hilarious infinite lore combos such as bouncing snakes infinitely and gaining lore off Merlin's shapeshifter. But beyond the silly, combo-y things like that, I think this location is just a solid card for Amber. That 7 willpower on turn 2 is just nuts. All things considered, this is a location that's been kinda slept on so far, and I think it's worth exploring for anyone who wants to try something new in Amber this set. And now we come to our final Amber card from Into the Inklands, Tiana's Palace Jazz Restaurant. This is a 3 cost uninkable location with a placement cost of 2, 
8 willpower, and 1 lore each turn. This one's simple, characters can't be challenged at this location. This sounds game breaking at first glance and there's a good reason why. If this card becomes too popular, it all but forces steel or ruby counter through action removal. And because of that challenge protection, any character with ward is going to feel right at home here. Cards like Cusco and even the new Kit Cloud Kicker come to mind, as they'll be slamming down 3 lore per turn at Tiana's palace. The only way to remove them with direct damage is to take out Tiana's palace first by challenging, but with 8 willpower, that's no easy feat. Similar to the Pride Lands, I think some of these amber locations have been looked over so far, which is surprising because this is a really cool and unique card. Alright, before we move on to Amethyst, here's a quick tier list of all the amber cards so far. Anything not listed here is simply ranked lower, but many of those cards could be considered in niche scenarios, so don't count them out just because of this ranking here. Now let's move over and look at Amethyst cards. First we have Alice T. Alchemist. She's a 6 cost inkable Amethyst character, Dreamborn, Hero, and Sorcerer, 4 strength, 4 willpower, and 2 lore. Alice can turn to exert a chosen opposing character as well as any other opposing characters with the same name. Turning to exert an enemy like this is an Amethyst ability. We saw that in set 1 with Elsa Snow Queen, but with Alice's 2 lore, she would feel much better if the ability happened whenever she quested, or perhaps simply when she's played out like we see with Pinocchio. Now perhaps that would have been a bit too powerful to add in here with Alice, but I'm unsure if her ability to exert all characters of the same name actually adds much value at all. Next we have Chernobog's followers, Creatures of Evil. They're a 1 cost inkable Amethyst character, storyborn and ally traits, 2 strength, 1 willpower, and 1 lore. This is our first 1 cost character with the 2-1 stat line, which is pretty neat, but these minions have an ability too. Whenever they quest, you may banish them to draw a card. They join the ranks of Cusco and Maleficent as early card draw characters in Amethyst, but really they remind me a bit of Popsicle, giving Amethyst a turn 1 draw tool, allowing you to see an extra card on turn 2 after you quest. Also, they do indeed synergize with Chernabog, because they do want to end up in the discard, but that does force you to run the Amber Amethyst combo if you want them in the same deck, and I probably wouldn't recommend that. Chernabog's followers are pretty good though, and they have already seen some play in a few popular Amethyst decks, but it's worth noting that they don't synergize very well with the bounce package, as you cannot bounce them back on turn 2 with Mim Snake unless you decide to not quest with them for the draw. And I do think this actually holds them back quite a bit. It doesn't mean that they're unplayable, it just means they won't be a staple in the majority of Amethyst decks because of the way they clash with the common Amethyst core. Speaking of Amethyst 1 drops, Diablo Faithful Pet joins in. He's a 1 cost inkable Amethyst character, Dreamborn and Ally traits, and again we see that 2 strength, 1 willpower, 1 lore spread. Diablo synergizes with Maleficent of course. Whenever you play a Maleficent character, you may look at the top card of your deck and place it back at the top or the bottom, similar to Ursula's Cauldron or Yzma. So far, scrying for cards like this hasn't been all that important in Lorcana, but I believe when playing this with Maleficent Sorceress, you could choose to scout with Diablo first before choosing to draw off Maleficent, so I do like that. But if you think about it, you're sort of spending 4 ink and 2 characters to accomplish what Develop Your Brain does on its own for 1 ink. I don't think it's always fair to compare directly across inks like that without further consideration, and in this case you do result in having characters on board, but that is an interesting way to think about it. I need to try out Diablo a bit more myself to be fair, but I don't think he feels very strong at the moment. Next up, Genie Supportive Friend joins Amethyst this set. He's a 4 cost uninkable character, 3 strength, 5 willpower, and 1 lore, with storyborn and ally traits. Whenever Genie quests, you may shovel him into your deck to draw 3 cards. There's a lot of Amethyst flavor here with card draw and even shuffling characters back into your deck for card draw. Genie is basically a Merlin rabbit from another dimension. He's a 4 cost uninkable that wants to enter and then leave play to draw you a bunch of cards. Instead of one when he bounces in or out though like rabbit, you'll have to wait and survive one turn. But if you do, you'll be able to quest, draw 3 cards right away, and shuffle Genie back into your deck. I think Genie has a lot of potential and even though I think Rabbit is the better card as you can draw right away, I do expect Genie to continue to grow in popularity over time. Next up is Hydros Ice Titan. This Storyborn Titan is a 3 cost inkable Amethyst character, 2 strength, 2 willpower, and 2 lore. He can exert himself to exert a chosen character. 
Similar to Alice that we saw earlier, I wish he could quest to activate, but it seems this is the standard for Freeze abilities ever since Elsa. In this case, I think Elsa's three willpower is more valuable, and yet despite that, plus Elsa's great potential with her Floodborne version, she's rarely played. That doesn't exactly encourage me to play Hydros here, but there are some Titan synergies that we'll cover later on that do like the idea of having Hydros in your deck. So unless Freeze and Challenge strats become prevalent, or a Titan deck becomes popular, I'll have to rate him a bit lower than I'd like to. Next we have Iago Pretty Polly. He's a 3 cost, inkable Amethyst character, storyborn and allied traits, 3 strength, 2 willpower, and 1 lore. Iago is another 3 cost evasive defender, joining the likes of Peter Pan and Fidget. It's nice to have another option across a different color, and he'll for sure be a tech option to keep in mind going forward. Not much else to say here, a really good flexible character card. Up next, joining Iago is Jafar Lamp Thief. He's a 3 cost inkable amethyst character, storyborn villain and sorcerer, with 2 strength, 2 willpower, and 2 lore. Jafar has that amethyst scry ability that we've been discussing. When you play him, look at 2 cards at the top of your deck, placing one back at the top and one at the bottom. But since he activates as he's played out, rather than when he quests or during a combo with another card, this instantly becomes a better version of the ability compared to cards like Yzma. Like many Amethyst characters, Jafar also brings the sorcerer and villain traits to the table, but Jafar is also valuable because of his ability to shift into Jafar Striking Illusionist. This Jafar is a 7 cost inkable Amethyst character, a Floodborne Sorcerer villain with 4 strength, 5 willpower, and 1 lore. He shifts in for 5 ink and he has a lot of Jafars to choose from with the two four cost Amethyst Jafars, the two Steel Jafars, and of course, the Lamp Thief we just saw. Striking Illusionist also has Evasive, which is nice, but the real power comes from his ability, Power Beyond Measure. If you haven't been tuned into Lorcana over the last week or two, this ability has been making quite the buzz. During your turn, while Jafar is exerted, you gain one lore whenever you draw a card. This means one lore from Rabbit or Maleficent being played, but also Jafar can exert to sing songs himself, gaining a lore when drawing with Let the Storm Rage On, or three lore off friends on the other side. And yes, as you've probably seen, this means Jafar can sing a whole new world and gain a fat seven lore, one for each card you draw. This does mean stringing together a whole new worlds by playing or singing them can gain you 14 or more lore on a single turn with Jafar. A lot of people have been a bit crazy about this combo, worried that it's a bit ridiculous, and warning that it'll take over and become the new dominant deck to beat. But I've always been a bit skeptical, and now that we've had a while to play, I really don't think Jafar is all that scary. Gaining 4 lore on or by turn 5 isn't all that unique. There's so many different decks that match or even surpass that pace of lore gathering. And using Jafar to gain 14 or more lore by that time requires a ton of setup and luck to pay off. And as I've said, if you've taken the time to do all that, many opposing decks will probably already have a decent amount of lore themselves. Beyond that, Jafar is not immune to Dragonfire, Let It Go, then along came Zeus, and even evasive challengers using Fish Hook or RLS Legacy. Now don't hear this as me saying he's bad, I do think he's really good, and he has an incredibly high ceiling of potential with explosive lore gain, and I've certainly lost some games to Jafar decks. And honestly, part of his strength is just the fact that Amethyst Steel is and always has been a really good ink pairing. So yes, Jafar is strong, he's very fun to play, and he's certainly a meta pick right now, but I don't think he's worth panicking over. Next up is Lena Saberwing, Rebellious Teenager. She's a two cost inkable Amethyst character, storyborn hero sorcerer with one strength, three willpower, and one lore. She has the rush keyword, meaning she can come out on turn two, ready to take down those pesky Lilos and Maleficents. I do think she could be an okay anti-aggro tool, especially when you're on the play. One three is not a terrible stat line for a two cost character in Amethyst, especially if you plan to bounce them back, similar to Olaf's role last set. That's about all I can say though, as Lena does have a lot of competition with cards like Snake and Cusco, and even Blue Fairy and Pinocchio all competing for that two cost slot across a variety of Amethyst decks. Next up, we have a few new Magic Brooms, starting with Magic Broom Dancing Duster. This Dreamborn Broom is an uninkable six cost Amethyst character, three three stats with one lore. When you play this broom out, if you have a sorcerer in play, you exert an opposing character and they can't ready until the start of your next turn. So this broom card introduces more sorcerer synergy, which is something I've been looking forward to for a while. 
After all, there are a ton of sorcerers in Lorcana, especially in Amethyst. But the best one for this dancing duster to work with is going to be Mickey Wayward Sorcerer, of course. He reduces the cost to play brooms by one, and returns them to your hand when they're banished in a challenge. Magic brooms also get a location this set that's tuned perfectly for them to really pop off in a broom-focused deck, which is pretty neat. I'll talk more about magic brooms as we go over the rest, but Dancing Duster does seem like a pretty clunky one. I'm not sure if that steep cost, even after Mickey discounts it, is worth the trouble. Our next magic broom is Magic Broom Swift Cleaner. This Dreamborn broom costs five to play and is uninkable with four strength, four willpower, two lore, and rush. Broom Swift Cleaner can also combo with Wayward Sorcerer to rush in for only four ink and take down enemies. But when compared to a card like Madame Mim Fox, even the reduced cost of four ink doesn't feel all that great with only four damage, especially when the card is uninkable. I suppose you could have two Wayward Sorcerers out, but at that point, the cost reduction doesn't matter since you're probably going to be on turn six or something by the time you play it out. Swift Cleaner does come with another ability. When he's played, you may shuffle all broom cards from your discard back into your deck. Swift Cleaner does feel a bit stronger than Dancing Duster, and it's nice that their two lore becomes three when played in the Sorcerer's Tower, which gives characters their extra lore. And despite my criticism, I am glad we have a broom with Rush. It works well with Dancing Duster, who can exert a character for you to rush into. But again, even with the cost reduction from Mickey, which requires him to be found and played alongside these brooms, it all feels a bit too expensive to combo together and would likely require a late game deck to function at all. Our third new magic broom is the Big Sweeper. This big guy is a three cost inkable Amethyst character, a dreamborn broom with one strength, five willpower and one lore. He has some location synergy, gaining two strength when at a location, and as we've seen, Brooms will primarily be utilizing the Sorcerer's Tower as they can move there for free in quests for one additional lore. And if you do have Mickey and the Broom Tower available, you could play out the Big Sweeper as a 3-5 with 2 lore for only 2 ink. If you can pull that off, that could be the clean sweep you need to win the game. Next up is Magic Carpet Flying Rug. And I'm so happy we have Magic Carpet in Lorcana. He's a 2 cost inkable Amethyst character with 2 strength, one willpower and one lore. Magic Carpet is evasive, as expected, and you can exert Carpet to move a character of yours to a location for free. Because he's an Amethyst, the first combo I think of is Carpet becoming a one-way shuttle for characters into the Queen's Castle, so you can start drawing cards each turn from your characters. But you'll get much more value out of Magic Carpet by bringing characters for free into locations that cost a lot more to enter. Things like RLS Legacy or Cusco's Palace come to mind. Magic Carpet is a card that will grow or shrink in popularity based on how prevalent locations and location movement decks are. And it's great that he has evasive as you can still get some value out of questing safely each turn, even if you don't have the locations out just yet for carpet to travel to. Next up is Magicka Dispel Ambitious Witch. She's a two cost inkable amethyst character, a storyborn villain sorcerer with two strength, three willpower and one lore. Magicka is a pretty standard two cost two three character. And like many characters in amethyst, she does have that duo of villain and sorcerer traits but she also has a Floodborne version. But before we get to that Magicka, we also have to cover Magicka Dispel Thieving Sorceress. Another Storyborne villain sorcerer, this Amethyst character is an inkable four cost with a three, four stat line and two lore. There's a few other characters with these stats, but Magicka has an interesting and unique ability. She can exert to return an item with a cost equal to or less than her strength to the player's hand. This means she can return any three cost item or I suppose more expensive items if you boost her strength, although I'm not sure if that will ever come into play. I wouldn't want to run strength boosting cards just so this random ability might be able to bounce a four or five cost item. In fact, I'm not too sure when her ability would ever really have a big impact. I suppose you could bounce an opponent's fishbone quill back, but by turn five, it's already served its purpose. You could also hit a spell book, but as mentioned, Magicka does have a Floodborne version and she's just as obsessed with quirky item abilities. Magicka Dispel the Midas Touch is a seven cost uninkable amethyst character that can shift in for five. She's a floodborne villain sorcerer with four strength, six willpower, and zero lore. Whenever she quests though, you'll gain lore equal to the cost of one of your items in play. This is another unique item focused ability here and I love that there's some direct item synergy in amethyst now that's potentially worth building around. In Amethyst alone, Floodborne Magicka might be the reason why you'd want to run Spellbook, 
as the pair could get you four lore each turn, but I think the real combos unlock with Sapphire and all its item synergy. Not only do you have items like the legendary Lucky Dime, or perhaps Eye of Fates to combo with, but there's just so much more item support and set up with cards like Scrooge, Maurice, and even Tamatoa. Now all this is clearly pointing towards a super wacky Amethyst Sapphire item deck, and I've only seen it a few times so far. It seems pretty fun, but I'm not convinced it's going to be a top list anytime soon. And this Floodborne Magicka Dispel seems like she's going to sink or swim depending on the status of this one very specific deck. Up next is Maleficent Mistress of Evil. This 5 cost inkable amethyst character is a legendary card with Storyborn, Floodborne, and Sorcerer traits. She has 2 strength, 3 willpower, and 2 lore. Maleficent has 2 interesting abilities. The first is that whenever she quests, you can draw a card. Not bad. Also, during your turn, whenever you do draw a card, you can move 1 damage from a chosen character to a chosen opposing character. This introduces a new damage movement mechanism that we'll see in a couple other cards, and it's pretty nice considering it's essentially a 1 damage ping plus a 1 damage heal. And I believe if you draw up to 3 cards off friends on the other side or something, you could move up to 3 damage. This is just like how Jafar can gain 1 lore off of each card drawn. After all, both cards read whenever you draw a card. All that seems fine and dandy, but Maleficent's stats are pretty bad for her cost. I mean, I know she has all this fun stuff from her abilities, but she's a 5 cost 2-3. I don't think any opponent is going to let her stick around for more than a turn, especially not with only 3 willpower. I think Maleficent could pick up a bit in popularity, but I don't expect her to become a mainstay in any decks at the moment. Next we have Mama Odie, Voice of Wisdom. She's an uninkable 6 cost Amethyst character, a dreamborn ally sorcerer with 3 strength, 6 willpower, and 2 lore. Mama Odie also gives us some damage movement in Amethyst, just like we saw with Maleficent, but she can move up to 2 damage from one character to another whenever she quests. That's actually a pretty significant 4 damage swing. But at the cost of 6 ink, plus she's uninkable, and the fact that her ability requires there to already be 2 damage somewhere, I'm not so sure about this card either. Maybe you guys are tired of hearing me discount cards because of their cost, but often Lorcana really does revolve around that. Getting a card out for a great value or even for free if it's a song is what every new card needs to be compared against in this game. Next up is Pua Potbellied Buddy. This storyborn ally is an inkable amethyst character with twos across the board, with Pua's cost, strength, willpower, and lore all set at two. And when Pua is banished, you may shuffle him back into your deck. Without the ability, Pua is an amethyst version of Aurora, and with it, he brings to mind his buddy Hei Hei. Both of these characters just love sticking around. Hei Hei in your hand and Pua in your deck. This Pua card might seem a bit odd at first. After all, you don't really want to dilute your deck with turn two characters, but in an aggro deck, that isn't all that bad. Plus, Pua has another great use. Whenever you shuffle him back into your deck, the deck is, well, shuffled. This is actually pretty nice in an amber deck that wants to scout out characters with Be Our Guest or songs with Ariel. Normally, any unchosen cards with these abilities get placed at the bottom of your deck. But if Pua goes down in battle, you can shuffle for a better chance to find those cards again. The same is true and perhaps even more impactful when paired with Emerald. Ursula is one of the most powerful cards in the game, and she'll be singing songs twice before sending them to the bottom of your deck. If you want to see them again later, and you're playing green-purple, consider letting Pua lend a helping hand. Next we have Rafiki Mystical Fighter. He's an inkable, one-cost Amethyst character, Dreamborn, Mentor, and Sorcerer, zero strength, two willpower, and one lore. Rafiki has Challenger plus three, meaning he goes from a 0-2 to a 3-2 when challenging. This is very similar to Hook, Forceful Duelist, and Steel, and it's nice to have that strong defensive opener in Amethyst, especially right now. There's a lot of strong 3 willpower characters and beefy locations that Rafiki would love to smack around with his stick. Also, it's pretty much irrelevant, but Rafiki also doesn't take any damage when challenging a Hyena character. Considering there's only one Hyena currently in the game, that doesn't mean all that much, but Rafiki is still a great character outside of that, essentially offering Amethyst their own version of Steel's classic turn 1 hook. Next up is our second Titan with Stratos Tornado Titan. He's a 5 cost inkable Amethyst character, a storyborn Titan with 4 strength, 4 willpower, and 0 lore pips. Normally that's the case with reckless characters, but Stratos isn't reckless. 
Instead, he's the main source of lore in a Titan-focused deck, as his Cyclone ability allows him to turn to gain lore equal to the number of Titan characters in play. Even on his own, he can gain one lore each turn. Stratos is an important piece in a Titan deck, considering he's the lore engine of the bunch. We'll talk more about Titans when we cover Hades and Pyros in Steel, but just know that Stratos is a niche card that probably won't be used outside of a Titan-themed deck. And although that is fun and super thematic, it's not exactly at the level of top meta decks. Next, we have another character from Fantasia with the Firebird, Force of Destruction. This is a four cost inkable amethyst character with six strength, two willpower, and one lore. This is our first four cost character with six strength, which is pretty neat, but that two willpower is very low. Low enough that pretty much any card can take down the Firebird, which isn't great. Such a high strength early on is good though, especially for taking down aggressive locations, and I suppose this is a candidate for a weight set deck, but two health really is a problem that's gonna hold this card back. A really awesome character though, and I don't think anyone was expecting the Firebird in Lorcana. It really makes me excited for all the future surprises in years to come. Up next is the Queen Hateful Rival. She's the three cost inkable amethyst character, four strength, three willpower, and one lore. We have a few versions of the Queen already, but this one is quite simple by comparison. She does have a healthy list of traits though, with Dreamborn, Villain, Queen, and Sorcerer all represented, but the Queen here is a simple 3 cost 4-3, joining the ranks of Horus, Baloo, and Naveen, this time in Amethyst. Because of those stats, just like the Firebird we just saw, the Queen is a welcome addition to an Amethyst weight set deck, but I think I might be one of the only players interested in that deck in the first place, so we'll move on to the next card. Next up is Treasure Guardian Protector of the Cave. I'm so happy this card is actually in the game, and I was thinking it was going to be a location as the Cave of Wonders, but it's cool that the Treasure Guardian has his own character card. He's a 4 cost, uninkable, storyborn amethyst character with 6 strength, 6 willpower, and 2 lore. Great stats for a 4 cost character but he can't challenge or quest unless he's at a location. This is a fun limitation in terms of the design choice, and I think it would feel pretty nice to play him out for 4 ink, plus pay 1 to move him to the Forbidden Mountain or the Queen's Castle, and at that point he's just a strong 5 cost 6 6 2 character. I do think the Treasure Guardian's uninkable status does hold him back a bit though, but this card might be slept on honestly. I need to try this one out on stream or something, I think I've only seen this being played like 1 or 2 times so far. A very fun card indeed. Next we have Ursula Sea Witch. She's a 3 cost uninkable amethyst character with dreamborn villain and sorcerer traits. 3 strength, 3 willpower, and 1 lore. Whenever this Ursula quests, a chosen opposing character can't ready at the start of their next turn. Ursula is essentially exactly what I was saying I wanted Elsa or Hydros to be like. I want that freeze ability on their quest rather than a non-quest excerpt. I suppose the trade-off for that difference is making her uninkable, which is unfortunate, and it probably does make her unplayable by comparison. One saving grace would be that she's a villain, but with so many other great villains in Amethyst, that trait doesn't really feel unique at all. I might be wrong about this one, but I don't have high hopes for this Ursula. Next up, our first Amethyst action is Bestow a Gift. This is a one cost inkable action and it allows you to move one damage from a chosen character onto a chosen opposing character. We saw this damage movement power earlier on Madame Odie and Maleficent, and I kind of like it being on a one cost action. This unlocks some interesting ideas with Mother Gothel and even Artist Rapunzel. I'm not sure these combos will merit the addition of Bestow a Gift into a deck, but it's an interesting idea worth considering. For now, it feels like a pretty average card, not bad for its cost though. Next is another one cost inkable action in Amethyst, It Calls Me, which is also a song. This card already feels a bit stronger when compared to Bestow a Gift. It's a card draw action with the potential drawback of shuffling three cards from your opponent's discard back into their deck. But depending on the cards you choose, this could be a powerful way to dilute their deck. You could throw back some low value turn one cards, or try to mess up their remaining inkable ratios, I suppose. But really, it makes sense that we get another card draw song in Amethyst, joining friends on the other side, and I think this one deserves a bit more attention than it's been getting so far. Next up, we have Last Ditch Effort. This is an uninkable 3 cost Amethyst action. It lets you exert an opposing character, and you also give one of your own characters Challenger plus 2. 
presumably to take down that character you just exerted. This is sort of like a freeze plus Merlin crab combo or something. It's an okay defensive action, but with it being uninkable, is it really good enough to run this over crab alone? He may allow the opponent to quest before they get taken down, but at least he's flexible and inkable. I guess I could see this as a tech card into certain matchups, but for now, last ditch effort really does describe how I feel about this card. And our final Amethyst action is the boss is on a roll. This is a three cost inkable action and song. Look at the top five cards of your deck and put any number of them at the top or bottom of your deck in any order. And as a bonus, gain one lore. This card seems really good to me. When compared to Merlin Goat, who can pretty easily gain two to three lore each, the bosses on a roll seems a little underwhelming, but it still provides immediate lore gain when played or sung for free. Plus, don't overlook that five turn scry. That alone can help you set up your next few turns, and that could entail setting up any number of cards that can help get you over that lore finish line. This card got some buzz when it was first revealed, but I haven't seen too much hype around it since. I definitely think it could be a sleeper pick this set in Amethyst Control decks. And remember, you can combine it across colors. It can be used with Ursula Deceiver of All to scry up to 10 cards deep and gain two lore. Not too shabby. Next up, we have an Amethyst item. This is the Lamp, a two cost unequal item that has two abilities in one. You can banish this item to either draw two cards if you have a Jafar in play, or you can return a character with a cost of four or less to their player's hand. That one is possible if you have a genie in play. And yes, if you have both out on the board, you could do both parts of the power. With Jafar, this is a simple two cost draw two, although it is uninkable. And with genie, more interesting uses begin to open up, like bouncing back your own rabbits and goats without needing a Madame Mim to do so. I think this is the type of card to show up as a one or two of in specific Amethyst decks, but it's certainly not a new must play staple. It does open up some pretty interesting potential though. Our next card is the Sorcerer's Hat. This is a two cost inkable Amethyst item. Exert and spend one lore, name a card and reveal the top card of your deck. If you name the right card, you draw it. Otherwise it's returned to the top. This is a fun card draw item that adds a little mini game where you can actually perform a little sorcerer's magic trick and draw a card if you guess correctly. To be 100% consistent though, other than running 99 puppies in a single sorcerer's hat, you'll need to have two sorcerer's hats on board. You could then use the first to scout the card and the second to draw the card since you now know the name. In other words, for four ink and two hats, you can start drawing a card each turn for two ink. Now that does require the two cards to set up, but two ink to draw is a major discount over running Magic Mirror and spending four ink to draw each turn. But with that said, I think Sorcerer's Hats are unnecessary for the same reason as Magic Mirrors. Amethyst just doesn't really need any other card draw. Between Friends, Rabbit, and Maleficent, and even the new Genie, you can find all the card draw you need while still playing out characters each turn. I think the Sorcerer's Hat would have been really great in the slower set one meta, but in the current format, the games are fast and they're simply better tools at our disposal. Next, we have the Forbidden Mountain Maleficent's Castle. This is the first of our Amethyst locations. It's an inkable two cost card with a movement cost of one, six willpower and one lore per turn. We saw Neverland in Amber, which was the one cost vanilla location, and this is the two cost version. And for that extra cost, this location receives two extra willpower. This one is pretty solid, although not as impactful as some other locations we'll take a look at soon. On turn two, you'll likely want to start setting up other characters or cards, so locations can feel a bit awkward to play, but still, the Forbidden Mountain offers basic location synergy in Amethyst decks and is an awesome location to have. Next, we have the Queen's Castle Mirror Chamber. This is another Amethyst location, this time a four cost inkable card. You'll be paying one ink as a movement cost and the Queen's Castle has seven willpower and provides two lore. Now this is a nice location and it feels absolutely like an Amethyst card. At the start of your turn, for each character you have at this location, you may draw a card. You know it's Amethyst when it draws you a card and feels a bit overstated. Seven willpower and two lore plus a card drawn per character for only a one ink movement cost and on top of all of that, the card itself is inkable. Don't get me wrong, I don't think Mirror Chamber is overly broken or a super big problem, but I do think it's one of the best locations and best cards we have this set. That seven willpower in particular is just right for surviving a single hit from Maui, 
So unless your opponent already has a strong board going into turn five or six, Queen's Castle is pretty much guaranteed to give you two lore and draw you at least one card if you have a character in it. And at the very least, it's gonna distract the opponent as they're forced to challenge the mirror chamber to take it down or play something in response like Then Along Came Zeus. Expect to see this in pretty much every Amethyst deck. It works well in aggro, mid-range, and control lists, so it's pretty much a new must-play staple for any Amethyst gamers. And finally, for our final Amethyst location, we have the Sorcerer's Tower Wondrous Workspace. This is a three-cost inkable location with a movement cost of two, seven willpower, and zero lore. And that's because every character at the Sorcerer's Tower gets plus one lore while here. This is a really interesting location, but it does require a cost of two ink per character to utilize. But that's not all. As we went over earlier, your magic brooms get a discount at the Sorcerer's Tower. They're able to move here for free, ignoring that movement cost. I think that changes this card from a lackluster location into a great one, but only in specific broom decks. If you like the idea of Mickey Wayward Sorcerer plus all the new magic brooms, you're gonna want to include the Sorcerer's Tower in your list. I'm not too sure how prevalent a brooms deck will be. I've seen it a few times and messed around a bit and so far it doesn't seem all that impressive, but it is a very fun and thematic deck to pilot. Alright, well those are my thoughts on Amber and Amethyst in Lorcana Set 3. Here's an updated tier list with Amethyst thrown in. You can see that even though I'm critical of Jafar, he's still a really good card, landing up there at the top just shy of the bare necessities. Well, if you enjoyed this video or not, make sure to like and subscribe. I'll have a second video up soon covering Emerald and Ruby, and after that, expect a much more consistent flow of content, including coverage for new deck lists. I know you guys are waiting for those, and I'm eager to share what I've been testing and running this set. Trust me, it's going to be worth the wait. Plus, I might even return to some YouTube live streams pretty soon. So if you're interested in all that stuff, make sure to hit the notification bell or join my Discord so you can get notified when new content is up. But anyways, thanks again for tuning in. I'll see you in the next one.